I mean, it was really bad. And there are very few cases I point to, and I pretty much put them all in the book, of where I had a good teacher who actually taught me something useful that I remember to this day. At the beginning, I just said, hey, you can design your own experiments, and you get to build your own equipment, you know, and they're like, ah, what do I do? You know, I don't know what to do. Honestly, that was the only time I can think of in college where I was actually enjoying myself. Whoa, this is like a little miniature brain here. This is Brain Inspired. Hey, it's Paul. I'm still in the spirit of celebration here on the podcast. So for episode 101, I asked Steve Potter to come back on. That is Steve Potter from episode number one. And it happened that he has written a book about his experiences teaching neuroscience and neuroengineering uh, to college students while also running his neuroengineering research lab. We talked about his research uh, way back when, on episode one. Um, He's done a lot of work growing and studying cultures of active populations of neurons. Brains in dishes, as one listener put it. So we begin the episode talking more about brains in dishes, uh, and kind of freeform about a variety of topics, like brain organoids, uh, artificial intelligence, alternative mechanisms of plasticity, uh, mind uploading, and other things. And then we go on to talk about his teaching experience and advice uh, as laid out in his book. The book is called How to Motivate Your Students to Love Learning. And it's a memoir as much as it is a how-to guide. So lots of stories intermixed with uh, a lot of advice. So Steve took teaching quite seriously, and he approached it like he's approached um, other pursuits in his life by a combination of constant uh, iteration um, through trial and error and and feedback, a lot of feedback, constantly trying to improve students' learning experience by understanding how to motivate them. And a core principle that emerged through his experience uh, was how valuable it is to do real-world uh, learning projects, things outside the classroom that impact uh, the real world. Examples like writing Wikipedia articles, uh, writing Amazon book reviews, and other projects. Um, It's almost like a way to give students a taste of what life in a lab might be like, where you're, you know, discovering and working on projects that are full of unknowns. This is actually quite relevant to brain-inspired listeners. So I know that many of you listen because the study of intelligence um, is almost like a hobby or a deep secondary interest. So the advice in Steve's book is especially applicable to you for teaching yourself how to get the most out of your own learning. Um, and make sure you're keeping yourself motivated. And I know that many others of you listening are faculty or postdocs uh, or graduate students, and you're either already teaching or or mentoring, or you will be soon. So in that regard, Steve's book is a great resource and a playbook for motivating your students to learn. Beyond that, personally, and you'll hear me talk about this, uh, reading the book connected much of my own past good and mostly bad learning experiences, uh, making me reflect and appreciate the best teachers that I've had and how valuable they were to me. So I really recommend the book. It's a little different than what we usually talk about. I found myself just uh, breezing through it because it was so engaging and just struck a chord with me personally. And it's just a really easy, fun read that literally lists many resources uh, and has lots of templates in it for the things that Steve has discovered works well through his own experience teaching. So I linked to the book in the show notes uh, at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 101. Oh yeah. And if you're a student out there uh, not enjoying one of your classes, maybe you can just sort of hint at your instructor. Hey, maybe you should go check out Steve's book. All right. Thanks for listening. And here's Steve. 101. You're on episodes one and two, but wow, uh, it's been a great, uh, long and wonderful trip for me, and I'm looking forward you know, to the next 100 or 200 or, or so, and thanks for coming back on the show again. Thanks, uh, Paul. This is a great honor. 
uh, I love this podcast and, and what you're doing and with it. And so let's, uh, let's see where this one goes. Well, let's, uh, let's get right into it. But so the last time we talked, um, we talked a lot about your laboratory life and culturing neurons and recording and stimulating and um, creating a closed loop system where you can actually train the neurons to do a few things like train simulated uh, animals called animats and hybrats uh, and, and then use the activity of the, the output activity of the neurons to then uh, figure out how to el- electrically stimulate the dish again. So it was a closed loop system. Really interesting stuff. Um, and I, are you still giving talks about that uh, material? Um, I am. You know, I talked to the carboncopies.org uh, yeah. foundation about brain emulation and talked a little bit about that stuff. I think you listened to that. We're going to uh, talk about that in just a minute. Great. Yeah. And, um, and I gave a talk in uh, remotely f- in Iran recently. They oh, had wow. a nice brain symposium where I talked all about that. And I think the, uh, among that stuff, um, you know, the, our most recent work where we close the loop, not only with electrical stimulation, but also optical optogenetic stimulation, uh, was, was in my opinion, some of the best work done in my lab. And this was John Newman and Ming Fei Fong's work. And, and, um, that's, that is still worth talking about. It's a very current topic. And it is, I'm yeah. happy to help anybody else out who, who wants to go down that path. Well, it was brand new when you were doing it. And it's still, it's very hot topic still. I mean, it hasn't gone away, obviously, yeah. the calcium imaging stuff. I came across, so I want to talk about cultured neurons for just a minute before, because we have a lot of other things to talk about. But um, yeah. I don't know if or- organoids or what, I don't, the brain organo- organoids uh, were a thing when you were developing your, your cultured neurons. Uh, do you know what that is? And I'm yeah. just wondering, like, on your overall thought on, you know, how they compare to using cultured neurons and what they, you know, if they are even comparable and just your overall thoughts on using organ organoids to study brains. Yeah, the, the quick answer is they're very much comparable. Um, organoids hit the scene probably in the, you know, early 2010s, I guess. Uh, they originally were called hanging drop cultures uh, because huh. of the way that you grow them in a, in a drip that's hanging underneath. And I don't know who coined the term organoids. They, when they, I guess it was when they sliced one open and they saw that it had differentiated into different types of, of you know, microanatomy. Uh, they said, whoa, this is like a little miniature oh. brain here. Uh, and it got a lot of press. And I, I wouldn't say that's unjustified. However, a lot of people got the interpretation or the impression that this was all brand new, that nobody had ever grown brains in culture before. Well, right. you know, there's a long history of people growing uh, neural tissue in culture, both slices, organotypic slices. And in our case, it was mostly um, dissociated cultures. But I should say that when you do that, they spontaneously organize themselves, whether they're growing on a flat surface mm-hmm. or floating in a hanging drip or whatever. Um, so I don't see any real functional difference between the organoids that are so popular right now and the cultures that we grew, which were not just a single cell layer thick. They were at least, you know, usually five layers thick. And sometimes they would clump up into balls that were exactly like organoids. Oh. Um, and the, the problem is that if they get bigger than about 100 microns in diameter, whether they're growing on a substrate or in a drip or whatever, uh, the, the tissue inside starts to die. It becomes necrotic from the lack of diffusion of nutrients and also the lack of removal of of the waste products. So nature solved this problem with blood vessels. Yeah. <laughs> and in culture, you don't have blood vessels, so you need some way of dealing with that. Uh, organotypic slices are typically grown on a permeable membrane that allows nutrients to come through from below and from above and, and gases from above. Um, the organoid cultures, if you read the literature, you'll see they, they are dying in the middle. You know, they, they tend to be necrotic in the middle and, and you have a certain amount of time before you, you've got something which is kind of rotten. Oh, I didn't realize so that. So we yeah. tried to, we tried to deal with this. I it was actually part of a big multi-group grant, uh, led by Steve DeWorth at Georgia Tech. That was a bioengineering research projects grant from the NIH. So it had big funding to make three dimensional cultures with a artificial circulatory system. Hmm. So we were collaborating with people who build microstructures at Georgia Tech 
that we're going to build little pipes that we're going to perfuse liquid through the middle of a big 3D culture. And we got somewhere. We did make some progress, but I have to say in five years, uh, we did not really solve this problem. Were they like little carbon nanotubes that they were? They, they were like that, yeah. They were actually made out of um, uh, perylene and a few other different polymers that you can mm. deposit by chemical vapor deposition, you know, all, all the sorts of microfabrication techniques, very sophisticated microfabrication. Some of it was etched silicon. These guys, um, Bruno Fraser was one of them. Ari Glazer was one of them. Who else? There was another guy on the grant. Anyway, very good engineers who do microfabrication were involved in the project and, and uh, we just really weren't able to make a 3D culture that was more than 100 microns thick survive thanks to all the technology we could throw at it. So anyway, that's a very long answer to your question about what do I think about organoids. I think they're very <laughs> exciting because they are a great in vitro model that you can play with and do all sorts of interesting things. One of the most exciting things about them that, that I heard is that you can make them from uh, stem cells. You can take stem cells and, and if you're clever about how to differentiate them and what things, what, what hormones to throw on them, you can get them to differentiate uh, into different types of tissues to represent different parts of the brain. In our culture dishes, we didn't get that sophisticated with trying to differentiate stem cells. We always got the tissue from embryonic um, rats, so they were already pretty much differentiated into neurons. And then you guys would uh, essentially shake them up and, and then let them diffuse onto these into these dishes. But then they would, uh, you know, immediately once they recovered, they would immediately start forming connections and retracting their spines, reaching out, retracting. and But this was all on a you know two-dimensional grid as well so that you could uh, record and, and stimulate, which is different than an organoid um, as well. And I don't, you know, are there advantages? I'm, I'm really kind of quite ignorant about the, um, about what organoids are you know, used for and what their potential is, aside from, you know, I know a little bit about wanting to study the sort of natural structure that emer that, um, emerges when, when I, you know, I had no idea they were formed in these drops, as you said. And it seems like they have a few different uses uh, relative to brains and dishes. Yeah, there are people who are trying to instrument them with lots of electrodes. Yeah. Okay. I think there are probably people who are trying to do optical recording from them as well. Uh, the key thing is that you have a cultured system that's a lot simpler than any mammalian brain out there. It's not simpler than some other brains. You know, you can look at C. elegans, a uh, little worm that's got quite a bit simpler brain than any organoid. But for a lot of people, the benefits of having actual mammalian neurons there mean a lot to them. And in the case of organoids, you can, you can grow them from stem cells that they got from humans. So you can actually have real right. human tissue right. there. We could have done that with our culture dishes as well. We were offered human tissue from my neurosurgeon friend who, who routinely cuts people's brains up and, and takes bits out that are causing epilepsy. Epilepsy, yeah. We decided that that was too fraught with ethical considerations that people might, might be upset about. The differences between human brain cells and rat brain cells when put in a culture dish are so minimal that we didn't worry about it. Our, our level of, of science was not there yet. Well, your cultures would just develop epilepsy anyway. <laughs> they would, exactly. Yeah. So, so cultures, uh, whether they're from healthy tissue or not, uh, start to get epileptic, which is an issue that we, we dealt with yeah. quite successfully. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to ask about, just harking back to our earlier conversation from a couple of years ago, you know, with the deep learning revolution, you have these model networks and a lot of people are, you know, quote unquote, opening the black box, trying to create explainable AI, come up with explanations of what's happening in the hidden units, ways of representing the information flow um, and, and what is being represented at, at different layers in the network. And so it may be a silly question to ask uh, about what the potential is to create artificial or create um cultured in vitro networks like you had on a, you know, finely structured substrate, uh, you know, where you could almost set them up like a, you know, artificial neural network or, or set up something akin to like an artificial neural network and then compare between the two, uh, train and compare between the two. And I, I know that you guys trained your in vitro networks and got to like a, 
I guess you'd say limited success, but we're, we're able to train. And then the networks could forget, would forget over time once you stopped the training regime. But there was a yeah. limited amount of su- success with that. But is it completely invisible, uh, infeasible to compare, to create something in a dish and compare it to an artificial network? Uh, well, there are many different kinds of artificial neural networks out there. Uh, we have a couple of good papers in which we used artificial neural network simulations. Uh, yeah. Zainas Chow is the first author. Uh, let me see if I can find one of those to mention. So this is from a journal called Neuroinformatics in 2005. It's called Effects of Random External Background Stimulation on Network Synaptic Stability mm-hmm. After Tetanization, a Modeling Study. Yeah. And what he did was he took a thousand neuron model uh, of integrate and fire neurons. He was basically using Isakevich's, um equations, I believe, for the model neurons. And we had inhibitory neurons and excitatory neurons in there and use those to develop the kind of plasticity experiments that we were also doing in our culture network. So mm-hmm. this is this is a model artificial neural network. Uh, so it fits what you just asked about. However, it's nothing like the kind of deep learning networks that you do back propagation with. So it's a very different thing than that. And to, there are people like Bruce Wheeler, who, who we collaborated with, who, um, who are trying to actually create a very structured connectivity in vitro. Mm. In other words, to, um, to say, I want this neuron to connect to this neuron, and we'll call this the input layer, and this the hidden layer, and this one the output layer. And we never did that. We never tried to pattern the substrates in any way to get them to connect up in a certain way. We, we, we felt, and I think this is still true, that we just don't know enough about the rules of how real neurons connect that we could dictate that. That doesn't stop you from trying, though. You know, you could be like Bruce Wheeler and try and just see what happens. Well, obviously, you wouldn't be able to back propagate and train the network the same way either. So there are lots of limitations, yeah. like you say. There are so many differences. Yeah, but I, you know, I don't think it's a completely foolish idea. I just think that it's um, it's probably a, a misguided goal because there, you're we're working with such a different kind of network. You know, yeah. the, the artificial neural networks that most people are using, I would say the people that are doing deep learning, you know, I, I don't want to, it really is important to make a distinction between the kind of folks who are trying to simulate uh, brain tissue and give the dynamics that brain tissue has versus the people who are trying to do AI yeah. and are much more brain inspired, I would say, if um, then... Yeah than, uh, you know, than emulating brains. Um, those, those types of neural networks are so non-biological. And, and most importantly, I think they're not very complicated. It's like, suppose you were trying to uh, model a factory, you know, a Tesla factory to make Tesla cars. And all you did was get a big warehouse and put 100 or 200 lathes in there, you know. No other tools whatsoever. And they're all the exact same lathe. Okay, great. A lathe is a great tool. You can cut things with it. You can make round things with it. Uh, but a hundred of them that are all identical do not make a factory. Uh, what the brain is is much more like a real factory with its complex assortment of tools and complicated interactions between the workflows in the factory. It's so much richer in its complexity and what it can do that... Uh, it's amazing that the deep learning networks have managed to do what they've done with these repetitive, all the same neurons that they mm-hmm. just, they hook them all up. And, and I, I guess basically the complexity comes in the learning process. You know, if you pump tons of data through that very repetitive, homogeneous uh, substrate of an artificial neural network, then it develops its own complexity in terms of the connectivity. But it's just not anywhere near as complex even as a, as a, you know, cultured dish of neurons or a brain organoid. Well, you know, one of the uh, complexities that's missing, of course, is uh, in artificial neural networks are glial cells. And I know that you're a yeah. fan of the, the <laughs> glial cells. And you, you've, uh, I don't, I, I can't recall if you mentioned it on the last, the last time that you were on, the, on episode one. But um, you, and, and I think this is in the uh, special 100th episode, but you uh, rue the fact that no one or very few people talk about the other kind of plasticity, which is um, action potential conduction velocity plasticity, which is governed a lot by uh, glial cells and the myelin that wraps around uh, the axons. Um, and I know that you saw dynamics in the calcium signal uh, signals in, in glial cells in your dishes. And 
Uh, I'm wondering if you think that glial stels are, are still getting the short shrift, or are they are they getting more attention that they deserve now? Uh, they're definitely still getting the sh- short shrift. Um, there are a few people across the world who do appreciate the, the possible, the very likely role uh, that glial cells might play in learning and memory. You know, I spoke with Mike Merzenich one time after hearing him give a talk about, he, you know, he, he's done amazing things, in, including basically inventing cochlear implants, uh, but, but, you know, lots of stuff about auditory physiology and auditory plasticity. And he showed data about how learning causes changes in the thickness of various white matter tracts. So, mm-hmm. for instance, corpus callosum or the, or the um, visual tracts, depending on what kind of learning you're doing. You know, they, 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 and they're looking at data from structural MRI scans. Uh, so, this is kind of where we're at now. This is, this is uh, so crude. We're at the millimeter scale here mm-hmm. of saying this white matter tract changed its size when somebody learns how to navigate taxis through London or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, that's great. But it just says nothing about mechanisms. All it says is there's plasticity in white matter. Now, that's just myelination. Uh, I think it's much more interesting to look in the gray matter. And I know there's a few groups like in Japan, I can't remember the name of them, but they're looking at glia that sit right next to the cell bodies of neurons in the gray matter. And they influence uh, the cell's decision to fire an action potential or not. Mm-hmm. They're right there at the axon hillock and, and uh, influencing somehow, we don't really know how, uh, whether these things fire and when they fire and at what thresholds they fire. And I suspect they're also influencing a lot of the branch point failures. You know, as a signal propagates down a branchy neuron, whether it's in the axonal arbor or in the dendritic tree, um, there it doesn't always propagate. Sometimes it just stops. And that has a lot to do with the recent history of that part of the neuron, and it has to do with the ions around the neuron, and yeah. it has to do probably with the glial cells that are around the neuron. That's my guess. So, so the answer is no. It's not getting enough credit, and the, you know it's a historical reason that glial cells don't fire action potentials. So you put an electrode in the brain. What do you hear? Yeah. You know, you yourself have said how exciting it is to hear the popping sound of real neurons when you stick electrodes in the brain. Why would you study glia? They're boring. You know, they're just there for support functions, right? Yes, but can you hear the silence? That's the glia, oh student of mine. That's what you. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah. listen, in between the spikes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, it could be. I have, um, I don't know, have you ever seen movies of, of calcium signals in glial networks? I have not, no, no. I wonder, is there a way I can share a link with you of one of those sure. movies? So what I'm seeing light up is all or mostly glial. Yeah, and you can tell by their morphology. They have this very Spire. flat look to yeah. them. You don't see a lot of of fine neurites in there. And I think in that culture, most of the neurons had died off. So there's almost only glial cells in that culture. So what does this tell us? So there's a lot of, act- so I see a lot of flashing activity. This is good for an audio uh, podcast. And, and do you see it? <laughs> One thing that I notice is how differentiated it is. It's not just there's a wave of crossing the whole dish here, like you oh, would yeah. expect in, in something that just has a support function. It looks like it's processing information to me. What do you think? Oh, gosh. I don't want, yeah, it looks like it. it is, but that's, you know, that's anyone's guess, right? Because I, I sort of anthropomorphize it anyway. But it does look like there is a pattern uh, um, across and among all of the, the glial cells. And I'll, is it okay to link to this in the show notes? It's on, yeah, is that on yeah, your feel Google Drive? Okay. Yeah. Feel yeah free. I'll link to it in the show notes. Yeah. So there's a lot of activity. <laughs> yeah. So, so watching those movies really opened my eyes to the possibility that glial cells are playing a much bigger role in not only information processing in the brain, but probably storage of information too. Mm. They could, they could be part of the memory. What the, one of the most interesting and important things that's different between glia and neurons besides the action potentials is that they divide. So in our culture dishes, the only cells that we're dividing were the glial cells. And, and, you know, what does that say? If they are t- storing memories, are they, do those get erased when they divide or mm. is they, are they somehow carried? Uh, or are the memories stored somewhere in the perineuronal structure, you know, this sort of um, crap that forms around the cells and holds them all in place 
uh, that the cells secrete various proteins and whatnot. There's, there's some people that are saying that's where the memories are stored, or one of the places memories are stored. It's so interesting. We're still so early. We, we're talking about yeah. where memories are stored. And, yeah, you know, we don't even know yet. No. I mean, we know some things. Obviously, synapses are one place where memories are stored. And, and But it, the problem is it's people are so focused on that. I wish they would open their minds a little bit. So one of the uh, ways that people can open their minds, and, and there's a push, um, you know, well, I'll just jump to it. So you were recently a part of a, a panel in a carbon copies um, workshop, I guess. Uh, in this particular workshop, so carbon copies is um, an attempt Oh, and by the way, I'll I'll be interviewing um, Randall Cohen and Kenneth Hayworth together. Fantastic! On the yeah, yeah. carboncopies.org. Don't forget the .org, or people mightn't be able to find it there. Yeah, is it nonprofit? I guess it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you were on a panel on uh, about you know what what's the right level of um, abstraction to worry about when uh, when performing a a whole brain emulation. <laughs> so that's kind of a mouthful, but um, and, and you talked a little bit about glial cells and, you know, the, the you know, potential of memory. Um, and I'll, I'll link to that as well, because that's a really interesting discussion. And there's a, a few other presenters and, and uh, Ken Hayworth and, and Randall are, you know, kind of running the show as well and participating. How did you come to be on that panel, first of all? And, uh, and then I, I just kind of want your thoughts on, on the whole on the whole whole brain emulation uh, game. Well, Randa Kerna and I have been friends for a long, long time. Uh, he used to work in Gerard Macher's group uh, in Netherlands, studying very similar things to what, what I was studying as a postdoc in Jerry Pine's lab at the time. Uh, so, so our uh, knowing about each other dates back to the 90s, and uh, we've met at numerous conferences and, and had talks about uh, all sorts of interesting things. And he is very unusual in the sense that he is a futurist who is not a crank. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> that comes across, I, yeah. I hate to say it, but most of the people who call themselves futurists are kind of a bit on the fringe of, of reality. Um, and not most of them are not even scientists, which is okay. You know, if, if non-scientists want to get into this stuff, that's great. As long as they don't spread uh, nonsense and, and things that are not true. That's fine with me. Uh, but Randall Kerna is a, is a real neuroscientist. He's done real electrophysiology. He's actually very good at it in, in vitro and in vivo, I believe. And he, he has decided that uh, this whole futurism thing is, is where he's going to go and, and created this organization. He's, he did a bunch of other stuff too before that that mm -hmm. was related to this. And so anyway, I guess the key thing there is that um, carboncopies.org is, is interested in saying, look, if we ever want to um, get an AI that's anywhere near as powerful as a human brain, uh, what do we have to do? They're just asking the question. And um, there are many, many aspects to that question. And my, I think one of my main points in that workshop that I was part of uh, was to keep reminding them to try to refine your question. You know, yeah, if, you, if you're too vague yes. <laughs> about what level of representation is important, then you're going to be just like the the folks in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy who who accidentally asked, you know, the greatest computer of all time, what was the answer to life, the universe, and everything, and it just came out with 42. It wasn't a very useful answer because they they didn't really specify the question very well. Yeah, yeah, you did keep coming back to that three or four times. And, yeah. and then Ken also has the Brain Preservation Foundation, which, you know, his point, just thinking about the glial cells, right? His point is that we already have pretty good technology that could fix tissue in such a way that when you die, uh, there's a very, very, very slim chance that if you were fixed using these techniques that you'd be able to just be brought back um, once we figure out how to reverse the process. Uh, and and that that's, you know, so so that's sort of his push on this whole thing. And that, that comes to the, like where memories are stored and how they're stored. And if glial yeah. cells are impo yeah. important, then you got to get them fixed in the, uh, you know, yeah. the same way. And uh, so it's, it's interesting stuff. So, but, so you're, you're very pro, are you, well, what's your, what's your take on the whole brain emulation, the outlook right now, and then maybe projecting because, you know, Randall uses a slide, I think, where he projects out every few dec every few decades up until 20, oh, I don't know, 
2170s or something like that, uh, and tries to be realistic about what can be achieved with the technology. And this is where the futurism and not being a crank and and being a, so pretty humble about what might be able to you know be achieved comes in. Yeah. Well, I think it's it's a it's a huge field. It does, it's there's not many of that people that are actually seriously talking about it or interested in it yet, but it's it has so many repercussions that it's huge. It's kind of like asking what's your take on farming, you know. <laughs> uh, what, well, what do you mean? What are you talking about on? farming of, of animals, of vegetables? Are <laughs> right. we talking about? Right. So, right. so it's so huge. It's that it really is that big. Um, and I kept on bringing this up, uh, saying, look, you know, what do you guys want to do? Do you want, are you just out here to make a good AI that we can use as helpers? Are you here to revive us after we're dead? You know, there's a lot of different reasons why you would want to emulate brains or parts of brains. I would say that my lab was already doing that. We were taking little pieces of brain tissue, putting it in a dish and trying to get it to remember things, to do, guide behavior, to um, to do various things that normally is the purview of just brains, uh, even though this is a very simplified system. And I would even say that the artificial neural networks guys who are doing deep learning are doing brain emulation of some sort. So, so, so all of this stuff I put in the brain emulation category and, and the, the real, uh, long term goal here is getting something that has human level capability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we can emulate something to that level, that will be amazing, first of all, and it'll be a long time in the future, second of all, because, Number one, as you said, there's so many things we, we are just at the beginning of understanding. And number two, it's just immensely complicated. Even if you uh, understand it, it doesn't mean that you can create it or, or even simulate it to enough precision to get it to do the right things. Yeah. Now, the, the, a lot of the debate that we had during that workshop was, do you need to simulate it? You know, Maybe you can just sweep most of that detail and that complexity under the carpet and not worry too much about it and and there's i think there's some pretty good arguments that that's the case but again even in that case you reminded them well it depends on what you want i mean you kept coming back to this point and dependent depends on yeah. what you're asking sorry to interrupt yeah so for example our thousand neuron simulation we wanted to study how, what was the effect of, of dish wide bursts of action potentials on learning and storing information patterns and recall and this model network produce the very same bursting patterns that our culture dishes produced. You know, after Zanus tuned the parameters a little bit, not very much, it produced very good uh, uh, dynamics that was true to what the living neurons were producing. And more importantly, it allowed us to design experiments that we could then go and do on the real neurons. You know, it, it allowed yeah. us to predict things. It wasn't just an explanatory thing. It was a, a prediction tool that we used. So our goal was to make a prediction tool that would allow us to run experiments uh, in, in silico, you could say, you know, in our computer model. It was actually on Zanus's gaming laptop. <laughs> We could run those models much quicker and more often and more many, more experiments than uh, he could do by growing neurons. And he just yeah. said, look, let's just simulate a bunch of these until we get it to work. And then uh, we'll we'll start doing it on real neurons. And then him and, and Doug Bauckham did that. And it worked. We were able to train the neurons. Well, one of the things that you so, – so carbon copies – by the way, hang on. Let me take a step back. Uh, I, I forgot to mention – I was going to mention this to you uh, before we started recording – but uh -huh. what the heck, it'll go into the recording. I still get emails uh, about your first episode. Uh, and one of my fa one of my favorites, you know, because people are, you know, really impressed by the work that you've done. <laughs> I still have this email in my inbox, um, marked unread for various reasons. But the, the subject line is brains in dishes, exclamation point, exclamation point. <laughs> About and they were they were uh, excited about your episode. So just oh, FYI, good. people are still listening to those. Good. Um, yeah. Well, we we were ahead of our time. The the whole in vitro networks as a model system was wasn't and still isn't really quite appreciated as in terms of how useful it was. And the or, the success of organoids lately is proof of that. You know that the people glommed onto that and said, yeah. "Wow, this is really cool." And I, I would say, go look at our papers. You know, the Potter Lab, our website has all our papers for downloading. And if you, if you look at those, you'll see there are a lot of interesting and useful stuff that my group did that, you know, the papers are well cited. They're still being cited. However, uh, they each, each one of those papers could have spawned a subfield of yeah. here's what you can do with cultured neural networks, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's glial computation or, you know, the, 
interesting um, dynamical processes that we observed or repeating patterns we observed or learning mechanisms we Cre observed. Creating art. <laughs> creating art, yeah. There's a whole other thing to do with the uh, art-science collaborations. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think, uh, yeah, I, 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 I really hesitate to say that we weren't appreciated as much as we should have been because that's not true. We were, you know, as I say, the papers are cited. However, I expected that by this time, a lot more labs would have picked this up and said, oh, yeah, brains and dishes. We should do that. Yeah, exclamation um, points. Exclamation points. Yeah. Uh, if you want to call them organoids, fine. That's fine. You yeah. can call them whatever the heck you want. You know, we... <laughs> We just, I think the key thing is that it's a much simpler system than an intact brain and allows you most, imp the most important aspect of it is it allows you to actually observe it while it's thinking and learning, uh, which is really hard to do in an, any animal that's moving around. Yeah. I guess in an organoid, you could do it to some extent these days in a, in a 3D volumetric uh, shaped thing with, with the calcium imaging now and the microscopy. I don't know. With, Probably, anyway, yeah. Yeah. I think so. But this, I mean, this brings me to my next question. In a previous episode, here's what you said about uh, academia versus industry. So I'll play that, and then maybe you can expand on it a little bit. So a realization that's hit me in the last five years is that the academic research model is just too slow. I have seen fantastic rapid advances by Neuralink and Kernel OpenAI and the Allen Institutes especially that have convinced me that we will get to understanding and emulating the brain much faster when billionaires fund such research, either for commercial or philanthropic reasons, rather than individual academics having to apply for and win government grants to get a tiny incremental step accomplished with a small team of researchers. We should take the neuroscience efforts of billionaires more seriously. I don't think that industry is that great at trying to un at, at understanding artificial intelligence or or natural intelligence i think they're very good at getting at accomplishing big goals mm. and usually those goals have to have some kind of return on investment a, a physical payoff of some sort to to be an industry it's not always true like for example the allen institute i, I don't know if you call that industry but we have a, a, a multi-billionaire who donate, a visionary, Paul Allen, who donated a lot of money to make these amazing discoveries that the Allen Institute is, is still making in artificial intelligence, cell science, immunology, and brains, all these different institutes that he started. That kind of stuff, it, it, you know, it it's it just moves everything along much faster than you see in academia. Academia, I, I haven't, um, you know, I, although I, I closed my lab up in 2015 and there's even a section in my book of, is about how, why or how I left academia, but I haven't really left academia. I, I'm still an adjunct professor at Georgia Tech. Uh, I still do consulting in neuroscience and, and, and mm. would collaborate with my former colleagues. So, I don't have anything against academia per se, <laughs> and I think that their model is actually very good at understanding things. They're much more keen on on getting at the understanding side of it. When you're in industry, you know, as I learned in what my one summer internship when I was in college and I worked in the industry, uh, whenever I asked questions about understand trying to understand things, they always said to me, "Why do you care? Huh. You know, that's not going to make us any money." Why are you asking this question? This is a waste of time. Let's get back to work. We have a product to build here. So, so what industry is good at is, is moving a product forward or some great accomplishment, you know, like getting SpaceX and throwing a zillion satellites up there so that rural areas can have the internet all over the world. You know, that's, that's a project that could never have happened in academia. Yeah, sure. So yeah. many billions of dollars to make it happen. And Neuralink is another one, you know, that Elon Musk, had needed, he needed a visionary like him to, to really push neural interfaces forward to where they could be useful. So, I, I know almost all of the players in the neural interfacing world. I, I worked with them. I, mm -hmm. I uh, collaborated with them. I saw them at conferences. We all went to the same conferences. So, all of these guys are, are great and I admire and respect them, but I have to say that the the... The progress that they made was so agonizingly slow mm -hmm. uh, that it always disappointed me. You know, I was repeatedly disappointed whenever I heard somebody, you know, like Andy Schwartz saying, here we put electrodes into a monkey, we've got it to 
to do so and so. Grab a marshmallow and bring it to its mouth, for instance. Yeah, he, yeah. he might have made great progress in understanding something about population coding, but he didn't really make any progress on understanding intelligence, I don't think, you know. Mm -hmm. And none of those guys have. Is that, There's is a few women involved in that also. Mm -hmm. Karen Moxon's one. Um, you know, they, they've done some... They've done some great engineering, those researchers who were doing a neural interface. They've, they've built probes, silicon probes that have become successful, help labs like Yuri Bujaki with their understanding of the brain. Um, but making a product that's useful to people, you know, and helping large numbers of people with some medical problem uh, be better or helping us all be more intelligent or something like that it just hasn't mm -hmm. happened. Nobody's been, no one's had the wheelbase to dream that big even, let alone do it until Elon Musk comes along and says, let's just do this, you know? Yeah, with his vision and money. <laughs> yeah, and he also has the luxury of just hiring and firing hundreds, if not thousands of people at will. You know, yeah. he can snap his fingers and if they're not doing the job, they're gone, you know? And if they are doing the job, you hire twice as many of them. Throughout my entire academic career, there is always, every week out here, basic research needs more funding. Labs need more funding. We need to get the NIH more to fund us more. And I had in the back of my head, I thought that all sounds sounds right. But then I just knew so many. Yeah, you know, I'm not you know even excluding myself. So many people who could have been doing more with the funding that they had, or refining their questions, like you were just talking about, asking better questions and making making sure they were they were setting up their experiments right. I'll say our experiments right. You know. Mm -hmm. And and I thought, well, maybe less funding is the answer. <laughs> but that you can't say that yeah. out loud in academia. Well, certainly, yeah, nobody will admit that. I can admit it now that I'm that I'm out of academia, right. quote unquote. Um, getting funding. Uh, the biggest problem with the funding situation is that we spend so much of our time trying to get funding. Once we got funding, it was usually quite a bit of funding. You know, usually it was a million or two million bucks per yeah. grant yeah. from the NIH. The NSF, not so much, but it was still a good amount. So, the problem was not, I don't think it was really the funding. Um, the problem was the kinds of projects that do get funded usually weren't that big and they weren't that um, collaborative. And there's very few labs that on their own could make a great advance in, in these big picture questions. Um, you know, but that's the way academia works. You, you chip away little by little, lab by lab at a big picture question, and eventually it does all get answered. And, and, and at some point, a few of those academics have spinoff companies and they, might hit it big, you know, yeah. they might actually make a product that sells. Uh, it could also be the case that they inspire by what they did chipping away, you know, what, what um, Wolpa and uh, Dick Norman did, you know, might have inspired Elon Musk and said, yeah, I want to do more of this neural interfacing thing. You know, even if, even if Norman wasn't able to do some big grand scale thing himself, he inspired a lot of people. So, um, so, so, so I think that I don't think it's a case that we needed more money in academia. I would say, if anything, what we needed was projects in which the funding agency requires it to be a collaboration between people that have the right skill set to get a big job done. Hmm. We had a few of those grants. I mentioned the 3D Culture Grant, the BRP, the Bioengineering hmm. Research Partnership that we got. Uh, was one of those. It involved six different PIs, I believe. And it was, you know, probably on the order of um, several million dollars a year g getting split amongst those six labs. So those kinds of projects need to be fun. And other ones are the ERCs coming from the NSF, the Engineering Resource Centers. They're big funding. And those accomplish amazing things. When you see what they accomplish, you say, wow, that's something else. I was part of one of those, this, uh, I don't know if it was ERC, but it was NSF-funded Center for Behavioral Neuroscience, which involved basically anyone in all of the Atlanta area, no matter which university they were at, Emory, Georgia Tech, um, Georgia State, the um, historically black colleges in, in Atlanta, all of those, whoever did any kind of behavioral neuroscience was part of the CBN, the Center for Behavioral Neuroscience. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so it was a big operation funded by the NSF and it accomplished so many amazing things. And we got together, you know, even in my own lab, so many, uh, my own lab benefited so much from the interactions we got with all these other behavioral neuroscientists from, from, you know, all the way from psychology down to looking at uh, sea slugs and, and whatnot. 
So is, is maybe the part of the answer, you know, and it's happening more and more is is creating these larger consortiums of of labs, right? There's I think International Brain Laboratory where there's a bunch of different labs that are willingly, um, you know, collecting into networks of labs that then share their resources and test, you know, equivalent hypotheses and things like that to really yeah. uh, nail down answers. Yeah, more of that. If there's any funders, uh, whether they're private foundations or government agencies listening to this, uh, put more money in those kind of big projects and, mm-hmm. and work really hard to make sure that whoever's running the show is responsible and, and has a track record that they're going to actually organize it. So the person running the CBN when I joined up uh, was Tom Insel, who subsequently became the head of NIMH and and uh, he is just a super sharp guy who who ran that thing really well. And then subsequently, um, uh, Stuart, Zola, Stuart, Stuart Zola ran the show at the CBN. And th- both of those guys really did a good job of making sure that everybody communicated. We have a, we had enough get-togethers, and whether they be social or, or mm-hmm. um, scientific, to make sure that we really did interact and learn a lot from each other. Great. Okay. Well, now it's, it's you know, only... 50 minutes in, but Steve, let's talk about a book. You had a productive research career. Something that we have not talked about, however, is your new book, How to Motivate Your Students to Love Learning. And this is a collection of everything that you've learned through your experience, your your massive experience, as we'll come to, to know as we talk about it, your massive teaching experience and, and testing things out. You've collected all of that, uh, along with a bunch of anecdotes, um, a lot of, you know, a lot of feedback from your students, good and bad, which was, I thought, one of the real strengths of the, of the book is you put some, um, some criticisms of some of the things that you, that you could improve uh, in your teaching. And which is interesting because this, you know, the whole book is sort of an ode to self-improvement and how to continue to improve to teach. Yeah, I like that. That's a good uh, byline that I'll probably quote you on, an ode to self-improvement. There you go. Okay. Yeah. I remember reading, you know, difficult papers when you're kind of starting out in a new field, right? And you have to go to the primary literature and it sometimes is almost impossible to understand anything that you're reading, for instance, even, you know, in research papers because it's so specialized and jargony. And I used to think that the blame was all on me uh, for just being ignorant and not being able to understand what was being communicated. Uh, and now having written papers, and I don't know, you know, how, I don't know how other people, you know, uh, experience my own writing. And of course, that's always with, a, you know, collaborators. But now I think most of the blame is on the writer. <laughs> and um, reading the book, I uh, reading your book, I, I really realized that a lot of the blame in my education is actually just poor teaching. I have my large fair share of that blame as well in my, in my own uh, motivating my own self motivation and intrinsic motivation and how that waxed and waned, you know, throughout the my academic career. So the book really kind of centers on an approach that you found really motivates students to learn. And that is by you would create these real world assignments and what's called problem based learning. And that's kind of the core of the book. You also uh, talk a lot about well, and we'll kind of run through this stuff. But the neuroscience underlying the learning and how to um, kind of a step-by-step to motivate students. You give like detailed syllabus, syllabi, that's plural, yeah, syllabi, um, for yeah. all of the things that you sort of honed over the years. So I, I, I you know, I wanted to get, I want to get into uh, a lot of these topics. And then, like I said, it's half autobiography as well. And, and you, you know, in the kind of the beginning of the book, you talk about how you were brought up and your experiences and how that shaped um, your thinking about how to teach uh, and your and what's useful uh, for learning in, in general. I guess I'll just start by asking how your upbringing influenced your your current outlook, or at least the beginnings of starting to test how to teach and and what works and what doesn't. Well, which aspects of my upbringing do you mean, like my family upbringing or my experience in school, or which which aspects are you asking about? So it's interesting. I, I mean, I have a lot of questions about this. You talk a lot about your family and how your mother was. Uh, really encouraging with a lot of different sorts of art projects, for instance, and and your yeah. dad was a jet propulsion laboratory uh, researcher, and he was always explaining to you how gadgets worked. Uh, I think I don't know if microscopes was the, is the the example or a camera. It's so, it, you know you give examples of this throughout the book. 
And you talk about how you knew you wanted to be a scientist by the time you were age five, uh, for instance. Yeah. And I think that that is not common, right? I think most scientists, when that happens, someone is willing to say that. <laughs> I knew it yeah. when I was five, right? Well, what I could tell you exactly what the pivotal moment in my upbringing was there, okay. which is uh, my my fifth birthday, I believe it was, when I got my uh, little set of screwdrivers um, <laughs> okay. and proceeded to take apart all of my toys uh, and figure out how they work. So, so I became a little engineer at that point, um, and my parents never complained about anything that I did. You know, I could get away with anything basically. And, yeah. And so taking apart my toys was just part of the deal. <laughs> taking apart your toys, building hang glider uh, racks on the top of your car eventually, just engineering everything that you did. I mean, it just seemed like you had this. So there were external factors, right? Your parents and the way that they uh, helped, you know, encourage that sort of thing in you. But but what struck me is there always seems to have been an intrinsic motivation. And I'm wondering if that is the case. I mean, you seem to be a naturally intrinsically motivated individual. And I'm wondering if that is true, if, that, if you have this natural intrinsic motivation and how much that actually has to do with what you eventually ended up trying to instill in your students, for instance. Um, yeah, that's definitely true. Uh, so, so some of my teaching practices came from introspecting, where do I get my motivation from? Mm -hmm. Um, I am definitely intrinsically motivated. My, my parents were not very good at motivating me, uh, in terms of, you know, saying you must do this or, or, um, you know, like for example, I did take up the flute in fourth grade, I think. And, On your own? And what was that? On your own without anyone suggesting it to you? Um, I believe it was a teacher probably said, uh, we're going to start music classes, and if any of you want to play a certain musical instrument, you have to talk to your parents and get them to fork over the money to rent whatever instrument it is. And I remember, you know, my family was pretty poor, and we had to go and rent a flute, which is made of silver. I mean, it was just looked like it was so expensive. Um, and that was probably a big decision between the two of them that I was not part of. You know, will we even pay for Steve to, to rent a flute? Because he's never expressed an interest in playing flute before, uh, why should he? Why should he ne do that now? And they did it. They got me the flute. I practiced up until the point where we had to learn uh, how to read music off paper, uh -huh. and that's kind of where I sort of fell behind and lost interest. And that's an example. So I was intrinsically motivated up to a point, but most people who are learning a new instrument require their parents to say, go and practice your flute now or play right. the piano or whatever right. it is. My parents never did that. So the intrinsic motivation apparently wasn't quite enough to keep me going, and I still haven't learned how to play the flute. It's, <laughs> it's going to happen someday, but... Uh, but I don't have quite enough motive, intrinsic motivation yet. Now, I think I, I do have more intrinsic motivation or did at least as a kid in, in doing all sorts of projects on my own. And so I did a lot of projects and got excited by them. And watching and reminiscing about that is part of what shaped my teaching, my, my whole pedagogy approach. Uh, that, that projects I saw, for me anyway, were always the thing that really got me excited. You know, whether it was building a model plane, soldering together a synthesizer, whatever it was, if it was a big project, um, mostly I was teaching myself, but occasionally I had a mentor like my mom or my dad helping me out or a friend of mine uh, or books in the library. You know, I'd go to the library. Um, and the key thing there is that you have to have some kind of scaffolding. Uh, yeah, yeah. In in school, you have teachers for that purpose. But if you're doing projects on your own at home, you kind of need someone to point the way for you at least. And, and sometimes I had that and other times I didn't and I just dropped it, whatever it was. I just didn't have enough scaffolding. I mean, what do you think about people who are obviously bright but who don't have that? And I'm thinking about, you know, in, in your younger years or in people's younger years, who don't have that intrinsic motivation that seemed um, so prevalent in, in your brain, um, you know, or that their interests are so divergent that they, they can't really hold focus on to finish a single project, for instance. Yeah, yeah. so the lack of focus is a, is a growing epidemic, I would say, worse than COVID-19. Um, 
I don't think there is a single kid out there who doesn't have a lot of intrinsic motivation. I mean, kids are just full of energy. I keep on, whenever I'm around children, which I love to be, I teach in maker spaces uh, and they just energize me because they're so full of energy and they all want to just do so many things. So the problem is much more not where do you get, get the energy. Kids naturally have that and they, they, the problem is focusing it staying, you know, on one project, whether it's learning flute or whatever. Um, and parents can help a lot there. Uh, teachers, um, wherever, wherever the kids can get it. Nowadays, YouTube is a great source of, yeah. of information to help focus and serve as kind of like a mentor. You know, it's kind of a one-way mentor. It's not very good at the two-way communication, but, right. but it's very useful for, for getting unstuck. If you're, if you're trying to do a project and you're a kid with a lot of intrinsic motivation, but you're feeling like you're frustrated, uh, there are a lot more resources now than there ever were when I was a kid. If I, if I can't, if I don't know how to cir- uh, solder a, a op amp, you know, say it successfully, uh, back then it was, okay, I get on my bike, bike five miles to the library, try to find a book on op amps, then try to figure out what does the language mean, get out a dictionary and say, okay, this is written at such a high level, I can't even understand it. Right. <laughs> Whereas nowadays it's like, here, we're going to do op amps today for people who don't know about op amps. This is what they are, you know? And, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, so, so the world has really improved in that regard. Uh, now, the, the thing that hasn't improved that's gotten much worse is the focusing thing. There's so many things pulling at kids nowadays or people of all ages uh, who want to learn something that their attention is divided and they can't really make much progress on any one project or any one effort. Um, it, or it's, they can, but it's just very difficult to stay focused. And, how, where do you get that focus from? That's a that's a really tough question. You know, the key <laughs> the key thing is is I suppose try not to give in to other factors that are influencing you, whether it's advertising, Netflix, or or whatever that's drawing your attention and, and defocusing you. Gaming is another one I can <laughs> speak to from a lot of personal experience when I was young. That's right. You hold the record in oh, what was that? <laughs> you talk about it on the book. Tried. What is yeah, it? Yeah, Robotron. Robotron, yeah, where you spent a, a summer basically uh, breaking records, hours and hours playing this game over and over, right? <laughs> Which I think a lot of people can relate to that. Yeah, and it was, it was, you know, mostly a waste of time. It was good for socially bonding me with my friends who I played games with. Uh, and nowadays, it's even much more social now that they have online gaming where everybody puts their headphones on and they're talking to people around the world that they're working on a, you know, Warcraft team or whatever. Yeah. So it, so it has social benefits, but other than that, it's kind of a waste of time in my I opinion. feel like it's a pretty limited benefit. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. And, and it has a lot of potential negative consequences in terms of making them get used to violence and, and other bad things like that. Right. One of the things that I continually was struck with reading the book is, so it's about uh, ostensibly, well, it is about uh, how to motivate your students, but one could also use this as a self-motivation, uh, how to develop one's own self-intrinsic mm-hmm. motivation. Like, what do I need to do? How do I need to structure my own curriculum, my own scaffolding to best optimize my completion rate on projects, on, you know, how to move forward, how to understand things? And, uh, and uh, you know, do you think that the principles espoused in the book uh, that, and we're going to go through a few of them here, do you think that they're just as you know, applicable for intrinsic self motivation. Uh, you mean outside of a school context? Yeah, uh, self learning. Yep. Yeah, because I mean, a, a, a lot of self motivation is a, is important in school as well. Um, well, we could go with both, but uh, but yeah. in school you have presumably if you have a teacher like you, uh, which are rare, then you have that right scaffolding. But if you're you know, someone like me or, or, or you know, even uh, lifelong learners, right, uh, that want to create their own uh, learning environment. It seems like these are just as applicable to that sort of setup. Yeah, I think a lot of them are. A lot of the things I talk about in the book are definitely relevant to um, to self-learning um, because my teaching style was mostly developed by me doing self-learning. As you will read in the autobiographical section, my education, my schooling was pretty crappy, yeah. you know, and I could count the good teachers I had on one hand. And I think I still have a finger that's not being used yet. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, 
it was really bad. And there are very few cases I could point to, and I pretty much put them all in the book, of where I had a good teacher who actually taught me something useful that I remember to this day. The rest of it was pretty much junk. And so most of the learning that I remember and then I found useful as a grown-up, as an adult, uh, were things I taught myself or I learned, you know, with my friends outside of school. So, yeah. so I think the key there is is mentoring. That that you know I, we touched on this a little bit before, but the great thing about school and project based learning in school is that you have a good scaffolding. You have a teacher who presumably knows enough about whatever it is that the kids are going to do projects on that they can help guide those projects. You know, it doesn't, I hate scripted projects as you read in the book, uh, but, but, uh, but they should definitely be developed in collaboration with the students. They should not be handed to the students and nor should they students be left on their own to create their own projects without any guidance. Both of those are kind of disaster situations. So, so what you need is a collaboration between the teachers and the students and other mentors that they might include, you know, and that goes for outside of school as well. So, so, my best advice to anyone who wants to do self-learning and to get more motivated or and or focused for self-learning at whatever age is find mentors you know so for example i've I, during the covid-19 i've taken up uh, an old hobby of mine rc plane flying which has really gotten much better since i used to do this back in grad school uh, thanks to the fact that there are electric motors now and lipo batteries and fpv cameras and all that stuff high tech stuff. So I'm learning all of those things. And I have several mentors who are YouTubers that uh, post tons of videos on this stuff. And, and, and whenever I watch those videos, I learn something. And occasionally I have posted a comment or asked a question and, and get fantastic feedback from them. So, so I really do think they are my mentors now, these, these YouTubers. Uh, and that's fantastic. The other thing is your parents. If you, if, the, if you've, for some reason, aren't getting uh, any mentoring from them, go to your uncles, go to your uh, friends, parents, or whatever source of potential mentors you can find and uh, get some mentoring. And they will help you define your projects. They will help you focus on and stay focused. You know, you can you can do this as a, as a group or as a pair of, of people that both need to learn this new thing, whatever it may be. So find mentors that will help you with the scaffolding because outside of school, that scaffolding is, is, is hard to come by. You really have to make sure it's there. You can try to do projects without scaffolding uh, and you might find that you, you're building a tower without a scaffold, which is a bit dangerous. <laughs> and you might find that you built it in the wrong place and you, in fact, built the wrong kind of tower. House of you cards. Know, somebody, yeah. <laughs> somebody who uh, is your mentor would point out to you, hey, you should build it over there. That would be a much better place to build your tower. Or you should be more careful when you do so-and-so because this tower is going to fall over, you know. So mentorship, that's really, really important. You mentioned um, that there were just, you know, maybe a few, uh, half a handful of of mentors or teachers when you're growing up that you can remember uh, that made a you know, positive impact or that were good, basically teachers. Uh, I'm going to ask you to tell uh, the story of your first real world assignment. So let's talk real world assignments uh, from Mr. Barnes. Um, th this happened to me multiple times reading your book where it taught me about my own history and I could reflect, for instance, uh, there's, there was a teacher named Miss Pittman in high school. And one of the assignments, she, we had multiple assignments like these. It was like the hardest assignment. We had to go to a retirement home. She had us go to re a retirement home, spend about an hour with, we each had an individual that we spent an hour with. And the goal was to learn their story. And then after about an hour, uh, visiting with them, uh, then we'd circle back around and then we would, everyone gathered in the room then, and then we would tell their story as if we were them. And I had, I mean, I remember I had a, a, a World War II veteran. He had a, a you know, a, a concentration camp tattoo and he like got through the war by boxing and that's how he got respected by his captors and this, you know, and I had to, and it was so nerve wracking, but so memorable and such a valuable experience. Wow. That's cool. So she had all sorts of what are called real world assignments, which I didn't know that there was a name for it. What age were you then? That was early high school yeah, or junior high. So already mm -hmm. pretty old. 
I even went first. I always tend to go first because I just want to get it over with because nerves, yeah. you know. But but you had that really early on, and I don't have examples, you know, from really early on. But what was your what is a real world assignment, and what did Mister Barnes uh, assign? You remember? Well, he did uh, a number of different real world assignments. Uh, he was he was te- this is a John Muir High School in Pasadena, as in the John Muir, the naturalist. Yeah, it was named after the naturalist John Muir, and coincidentally, I went to John Muir College at UC San Diego. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> so. I am I am a nature lover, so it was it was destined to be. Anyway, uh, Bob Barnes was a fantastic teacher, and the main reason he was was because he he realized that an urban studies class could be boring or it could actually be useful. And he he uh, what, like for example, one of the assignments was for us to learn all about how markets that sell groceries price their goods, and so we went into three different sizes of shops and had a big list of, of various things that we might buy that we had to find the prices for. And at the end of that, I was fantastic at, at knowing what we should get whenever we went shopping <laughs> with the family. I could say, oh, no, you should get this bigger package because it's a little bit cheaper and and don't fall for that. That's just a coupon deal. It's not actually going to save us anything. you know. So, I was I was much more knowledgeable and a much better shopper after that. And I ended up working in high school as a as a box boy in the supermarket. So, so that actually came in really handy just in terms of working in the supermarket as well. He didn't know that I was going to do that, and I, I don't think it influenced my decision to work in the supermarket. Right. <laughs> it just just happened to be the job that was available at the time. But anyway, there were also uh, a lot of opportunities for real world learning through the ski club that he was the advisor of. So I, I took a, a role of organizing several ski trips right. for my my fellow high school students. And he he really did a good job of shepherding us, giving us the scaffolding we needed to do this organizing, um, but not getting in our way and not being impressive with his rules or anything. You know, he's he was just a master at that, knowing knowing just how hands on to be. And so that pretty much went for for all of his uh, little real world assignments. And uh, another one was going to a house that was having an open house for sale, and uh, right. hopefully finding the realtor during a quiet moment and saying, "Is it okay? Even though I'm a high school student who obviously doesn't have the money to buy this house, is it okay if I pretend I'm going to buy it? Can I ask you questions as if I'm going to buy it?" And we interviewed the realtor and, and drew up a floor plan of the house and. And the realtor was happy to to help. Yeah, and we yeah. we learned about buying houses, you know, which is something that you need to know if you when you grow up, or you might need to know, or likely. And it's much better learning than if he just had given us a handout saying, "Here are the things you need to know when you buy a house." We would have thrown it away and forgot about it by the yeah. time we were actually going to buy a house. Yeah, I mean, these are often I, I think examples like this are often feel painful at the time, and you know, can be fun, but are especially in retrospect, the most rewarding things, the most valuable things. Um, And I don't know if your students, I don't know if they felt, you know, there are some, because you you quote uh, your students, one of the things that you do um, constantly did was um, you would put little survey questions at the end of quizzes and tests and things. And so you would get direct feedback from the students. And so there, I think there are, you know, a handful in there about, you know, your courses being, demanding, but really worth it. And, you know, we'll talk more about that uh, as we move forward. Maybe what we should do is just step through a few of the ways that, um, you know, students are are motivated that you list in the the book. So you have, you know, a bunch of sections, we don't have to go through them all. But um, it might be worth starting with, you know, the Yerkes-Dodson curve, which uh, is this, well, I'll just let you explain what the Yerkes-Dodson curve is and, and how it relates to keeping students engaged. Okay, uh, it's pronounced Yerkes, Yerkes. and um, <laughs> rhymes with turkeys. That's the way to remember it. You need an audiobook version. <laughs> yeah. So Yerkes Dodson curve is something that psychologists know a lot about. I know I know only a little bit about it, but the key thing is that it's a graph of performance versus uh, the level of excitement, and it forms what they call an inverted U shape. So it's a, just a hill. Um, 
that, that drops off on both ends. Okay. It's not a bell curve. It's not something that has long tails. It's something that drops off because when you are very unexcited, that means you're asleep. Your performance is really poor when you're asleep or you're dead. You know, there's, there's an obvious end to the curve there. On the other end, you're overexcited and you are so hyperactive, you're manic. You can't even think straight. You're a capital rioter. Yeah. You might be a rioter. Exactly. Yeah. You might just do some foolish things there. So you're not, you're not going to, your performance at getting something accomplished, especially in a school context is, is really poor, uh, on the excited end or on the not excited end. So somewhere at the middle is the optimum level of excitement that you want to be at to learn. And this is something the teachers need to have in the back of their mind all the time when they're running their classes. Constantly, they need to be thinking about this curve and saying, Okay, how excited are my students? Do I need to get them riled up? Do I need to get their enthusiasm going? Or are they too excited? And are they not focused? And are they all just chatting and having a great time or, or looking at their phones or whatever? Do I need to calm them down? You know, I, I watched my sister Sandra do her uh, class a few times where she would actually have them do mindfulness meditation in the middle of class. You know, they can, okay, you just come back from recess. They're all excited. They're all bouncing off the walls. Okay, let's just calm down and relax and look at our little, they made little bottles with glitter in them that they could look at and focus <laughs> on and while well, they relaxed and had a mindful moment. So, so she was and still is very good at, at modulating this excitement level in her students. And I think the good teachers have to keep that in mind all the time. Yeah, I wanted to bring that up first because uh, it sort of the centerpiece of, and like you just said, you always have to keep that in mind of a lot of the other uh, ways that you list uh, to keep, you know, students motivated is within all of these other things that, and we'll talk about a few, you have to keep them at that right level of engagement. I don't, maybe, you know, would you like to uh, just say a few words about, you know, either either of the topics that of your choosing? I, I assume you don't want to step through each one. Yeah. Well, I think the, um, so, so getting, Students, I, I shouldn't even say it's, this book is just for educating kids because uh, you know I did my teaching of of adults right. in the college at the university level. I sometimes would refer to them as kids because they're a lot younger than me, but they they weren't kids; they were young adults. Getting your students excited is really important. Okay, we covered that pretty much. Uh, I think that's kind of obvious. Most people know that, but they don't really think about it at every moment of their teaching. You know, they, and they mightn't think about how dangerous it is to get them too excited. They might just say, "Yeah, the better excited, more excited they are, the better." Mm. No, that's not true. <laughs> um, the thing that I really want to emphasize, probably of that list of various things, I think there's six different things I have here in the book, um, is to do with social motivation. Mm. So I call it motivation from interaction. And I honestly think this is the strongest motivator that that almost anybody has. You know, there are a few of us like me who tend to be loners who are less motivated by social interactions, but we still are. And peer pressure is a huge motivator for for kids, especially adolescents. But, uh, but all kids, in fact, look at what their peers are doing and they very much care what their peers think about them and they will be motivated by that. And so as a teacher, you can just ignore that and say, oh, that's stuff for their playground. You know, that's, that's what they do on recess. But no, what you should do is take advantage of that. And one way to do that is with teams, you know, have the students work in teams and tell the teams, you guys are a team, you have to work as a cohesive unit. And if there's anybody who's not pulling their load, you need to let them know that. Hmm. And if there's anybody who's doing a great job, you need to let them know that too, because uh, that's all part of the whole peer pressure thing. If you want to get maximum motivation from social interactions, uh, both the positive and the negative need to be brought up in class regularly in terms of, of good social interactions and bad social interactions. And uh, you will find you can leverage those things. So, so it won't be so much work for you to get the students excited and motivated. You can let the students themselves do a lot of that work by their social interactions. I mean, it seems like that's that could be a fine line because there are some people who are um... – shine more, I suppose, or are more, much more comfortable, let's say, working in groups. And, and then there's this dynamic of a natural leader will arise or a know-it-all. And 
So there are a lot of different layers and dynamics going on in those oh, social yeah. groups. So you, you have to pay attention to that as well, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, you do. You have to pay attention to it. So I was teaching one of the courses I taught is is problem based learning um, for first years in at Georgia Tech in the biomedical engineering department. And they, I would sit in a room with eight students for an hour and a half, twice a week. Um, and during an hour and a half, you can go through a lot of material and get really get to know all eight of them. And they get to know you after a while, too. And your job is not to teach, but to facilitate the group interaction and to provide a little bit of scaffolding, but mostly in terms of the meta skills, not in, the, not in terms of the problem they're trying to solve. They have to figure that out themselves. But, but in terms of how they go about solving it and group interactions is one of the big things that you can scaffold them on. So, for example, if I notice that there's somebody who is a really good uh, leader type person, you know, and, and maybe she's really charismatic and everybody tends to believe everything she says, I, w I might right after she says something and everybody's nodding their head going, yeah, 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 that's, that's great. I'm so glad she knows that. I would say to somebody else in the room, uh, do you think that's true? How do you know that's true? What she just said there, you know, so, so just a, with a little thing like that, she, she's probably got the confidence level that that won't devastate her if I'm doubting her. And I, <laughs> after a while, they'll all learn that me, one of my big lessons I'm teaching constantly is to be skeptical of every little thing in biomedical engineering. You got to be very skeptical. Mm -hmm. And uh, another one is if there's a quiet student to take that uh, person who's more comfortable with social interactions and being a leader and saying, hey, uh, do you think next time we meet, you could bring that quiet person out, you know, use all that energy you have to uh, to get them to contribute more. You know, you you are contributing little more than you should. You're taking more of the of the time that the class has available for discussion um, to to give your own ideas. And I think some of the people aren't getting heard. So maybe you can, after you've said your ideas, go to the quietest person and say, what do you think about that? Mm -hmm. And bring them out. And and they're usually happy to do that. And, and the quiet person is usually happy to be included. It's like, oh, yeah, the, the leader person is actually cares what I have to say. Maybe I should say something here. Um, so so that's a, uh, just an example of the, you're right, it's very complicated dynamics that go on in classes, especially in these problems that we're trying to solve or big projects. Um, and teachers have to be kind of fine-tuned there. I wouldn't say that I'm very good at it. I became much better at it after doing a lot of these teachings, but uh, there are other people who are much more naturally gifted in this regard and tuning in to what are the social dynamics of their students. I was going to ask about this later, but I'm going to bring it up now because um, when you're going and asking that, that person to contribute in a, you know, in, a, in a group way, in a various way to bring, bring, bring the quiet person out, you're going to them uh, knowing their name and a lot about them already and calling them by name because on what you, I don't know if you, when you started doing this, but you described the process and, and this just goes to the, the demands that it take, that it takes to be a teacher like you have been. At the first day of class, you would have everyone write down their name. You would have everyone write down their name on an index card and some piece of information. I, I, I don't have it in front of me, but then you would have them read that into a camera record all of the names and sometimes this is up to 300 or so or uh, about a hundred was 100. the biggest class that i taught then um, you'd go home and memorize them all good god yeah. man <laughs> well uh that i think that the, the, that doesn't uh <laughs> necessarily imply that i am some kind of a superhero uh, I mentioned in the book that I'm not I'm not very good at remembering names or faces, and that um, I put the work into it because I knew something about how the brain works and how memory works. It works by association, and so those index cards that they wrote, I had them write something of interest to them, and a question like, "Why did you take this class?" Right, you know, right. It was okay. first day of class. They must have had a reason for taking it. If they didn't, maybe they should be dropping the class and <laughs> moving on to the next one. But anyway, I so to learn people's names. Remember, it's not just their. It's not just names you're learning. It's you're learning faces and names, 
And you'll be able to remember those faces and names much better if there are quite a few other things you can also associate with those names and faces. So the more things you can associate, the better. This is something that I knew just from being a neuroscientist. Probably a lot of teachers already knew this. Um, and, you know, pedagogical tools might have emphasized this or they might not. You know, to learn the times tables, we never learned it by association. We learned it by, you know, reciting the times tables over and over again. Uh, so there are other ways to learn, but the best way to learn these kinds of things like names and faces that are kind of arbitrary is by associating them with lots of little details. So the sound of the person's voice on my camera recording, the, the way their face looks, the way they move, um, the, the level of enthusiasm they may or may not have when they're talking into a camera on the first day of class, um, and some little detail about why they took class or what they're interested in. All that stuff gets connected in my brain and, and helps me put a name to that face whenever I see them again. And what I noticed is that that association would fade pretty quickly. And I had to keep reinforcing it hmm. pretty much uh, every single class. Before class, I would, I would look at this printout of all the faces and I would test myself by writing as quick as I could the names under each person's face. Um, because when you're answering questions in class, you have to be quick. You, yeah. you, 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 don't, you don't have more than a second or so before if someone raises their hand for you to call on them and say their name. So I would, I would do a speed reinforcement uh, by, by trying to remember their names uh, from pictures that I had made from the video. And it took a lot of work. Uh, it, took, it took replaying that video, I would say, 50 times the day after the first day of class. And subsequently, I didn't have to look at the video again. I, I pretty much only had to look at their uh, index cards once in a while and remind myself of some of the things on the index cards. So, so, so the key lessons there are uh, make associations, put a lot of work into it for only one day. That's not that much work. You know, I think of almost every school teacher will spend an entire evening or, or day preparing one lesson plan. It's not at all unusual for a teacher to put an entire day of work into something that's only going to take an hour of their time later to, uh, to benefit the students from. So if it's going to benefit all year long or all semester long, like knowing their names, it's well worth putting a day of work into it and then reinforcing it for five minutes before each class. It's not, it's not that big of an ordeal, really. Well, I'll, I'll just mention one more of the six um, pieces of advice that you give to uh, keep students motivated. And, uh, and, uh, um, and people can read the book for the, the rest, but as, uh, that is by control or autonomy sort of and and this will segue into the kinds of projects that you that you chose for the the students as teaching as and learning examples um and i chose this one because so so there's so you want you give as much control as possible to the students in deciding the topic of their project or you know the the type of well the topic of their project for instance and yeah. and this is one of those areas where you actually did get some pushback that you were some some students felt like you're giving too much control. And it's just interesting because there's such a, a variety of different types of learners and where people are in their heads and in their own intrinsic motivations. I, 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 that could be pretty intimidating to someone. Some people just want to be told what to do. Right. But but you found that this is a way to keep them at that right level at the Yerkes Dodson curve. See, I got the name right there. Uh, okay. And, you know, because it always kind of goes back to that because too much control, too much autonomy, and they might be not motivated enough. And, you know, so there's this always this balancing act. Yeah, you have to, you definitely have to, um, you always have to tune the amount of control, but it's not something that you just decide at the beginning and say, okay, I'm going to give my students this much control. The key thing is that you have to be adaptive during the projects or during whatever it is you're trying to accomplish with the students. Keep monitoring them and noticing if they feel lost because they were given too much control. That was a very common thing in my classes, you know, that at the beginning I just said, hey, you can design your own experiments and you get to build your own equipment, you know, and they're like, ah, what do I do? You know, I don't know what to do. So, so you have to <laughs> calm them down and say, relax, it's okay. Uh, here are some ideas. Here, we're going to read the literature and get used to the kinds of things that you could do. And, um, and you, that's what I call scaffolding. 
uh, the most important kind of scaffolding that I did in my, in, especially in my neuroengineering lab class, uh, was was really guiding them in a in a very close um, feedback loop, where they were making decisions, and I would judge, you know, were they on the right track or not, and if they weren't, I might guide them in a different way. Uh, and if they were, I would encourage them or I might just point them in the direction of where they would get more information to help guide themselves. Um, but the key thing is you, you definitely have to keep modulating that control level continuously throughout the whole process. It's not just something that you make a, a, a blanket decision at the beginning. And it's not also, it's also not a one size fits all. As you mm-hmm. pointed out, some students are more comfortable with being in control of their own schooling than others, especially if they've been through schooling that never gave them control. You know, like my schooling, very seldom did I get to decide anything about my schooling. Mm. Um, and if you suddenly throw them into a class like mine where they suddenly have a lot of control, uh, it could be very scary and, and, and painful for them emotionally. Yeah. Um, so you have to realize that and, and gradually let them in. And, and um, I think one thing that I did that really helped in that regard was to uh, have former students come to the class and say, look, this is what I did. It was really fun. Trust me, it's worth it. You know, <laughs> once you get used to the idea you have control, it's really cool to have control or, or to show them videos of what the previous students did, you know. Mm. So, so what that means is you have to plan ahead for the next year and take some videos of what the students are accomplishing with the intention of showing them to the following class. And if you don't have them, then go online and find those kinds of videos of something that's similar to what you want to accomplish in your class and say, look, these students are doing this. This is the kind of thing you guys could be doing. You could have projects like this that are going to change the world. And it's not too scary because, look, these guys are doing it and they're only fourth graders and you're, you know, 10th graders or whatever. (laughs) Um, So, so, so yeah, there's, there's, there are a lot of different ways to ease them into this idea, which might be very foreign to them, which will be almost certainly if they're raised in American schools, uh, will probably be foreign to them. Yeah. Oh, I didn't think about culturally across different education systems, how, how this sort of thing plays out. Yeah. It might be useful just to step through one or two of the real world assignments that you used. I don't know if you want to talk about the lab class more or you know, the Wikipedia projects. I do want to ask about think, Wikipedia also. Yeah, I think Wikipedia is a good one because it's um, it's applicable to any subject. You know, you it was I was um, teaching an introductory neuroscience course. However, my real world project that the students had to do was to write Wikipedia articles on some neuroscience related topic that they got to choose. So I gave them the control to choose the topic. And the way they did that was to basically just mine their own thinking for which aspects of the brain are they most excited about? Why did they take this course anyway? Um, if I had already given a lecture or two, they might already have some ideas of which mm-hmm. parts of the brain they care the most about. And once they've done that, they go, they were to go on Wikipedia and try to find whether there's any article there about it. And when I first started doing this was 2006, um, there weren't, you know, Wikipedia had giant holes in it in the neuroscience world. Yeah. Still does, but they're not nearly as big as they were then. So pretty much anything the students wanted to write an article on for Wikipedia to do with neuroscience was available and needed to be written. So, and also the other thing was that it wasn't uh, nearly as well respected then as it is now as a, as a reference material. And, you know, for good reason, it was pretty crap back then. Um, but my students have written over 300 articles for Wikipedia and improved it tremendously in the process, at least in terms of the neuroscience that you can find there. So, so I, I first just kind of, the, the way this worked was, uh, I was, I was going to teach a course that it turns out the, for various, um, logistical reasons, the enrollment turned out to be too low for the course to be taught. You know, they have a threshold that says if not enough students sign up for it, we're, we're canceling the course. Two of the students were so disappointed. I said, well, why don't you guys do an independent study course with me? We'll work together on some project. And it was probably one of them that came up with the idea. I'm not even sure whose idea it was. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I said, let's do uh, a Wikipedia article writing project. And they got to choose what the subject was. And those two were basically the, the alpha testers. I won't even say beta testers, the alpha testers <laughs> of this idea of can students even write a Wikipedia article? Because that was an unknown thing back then. Um, 
and they did it. It was a lot of work for, for them both. And they wrote a fantastic article. I think it was, it was about nerve regeneration. They ended up uh, both contributing to a very large article. And, and subsequently, I decided to break up those kinds of articles into mm. multiple articles. But, but anyway, because they were so successful, my co-teacher, Niall McCarty, and I said, next time we teach introductory neuroscience, we're going to make that the project instead of a term paper. We had a term paper before that and I just said, oh, term papers are so boring. You know, let them do something that's useful, that actually benefits the world. And it was a huge success, even from the beginning. It was awkward and everybody was kind of floundering in the dark, including me. I didn't really know the rules of, of editing Wikipedia, but I said, look, you guys, there's tutorials up there. Let's just follow them and, and uh, see what we can come up with. And it worked and it got better and better. Every year we got more understanding of how the, how the rules worked. And Wikipedia, the Wikimedia Foundation developed more and more tools to help teachers do this. Right. And now they've got a whole side wiki education project, uh, that is specifically for this purpose of getting teachers to get involved in having their students do Wikipedia writing, you know, may not be creating whole articles from scratch anymore because yeah. most of the articles are up there. That's why I was wondering. Just a little bit of editing here and there could really benefit most articles. And it's not just for English classes either, you know. It could be a subject matter in any subject you could imagine. It should be up there on Wikipedia and probably already is somewhere. And if it's not, your students could be uh, putting it up there. I guess this, um, I mean, this goes back to one of the other motivating factors that you write about, which is a sense of accomplishment. Uh, and that is, you know, it is a real feeling of accomplishment and and you communicated this to them as well that you know they they and and they communicated it back to you that they really felt like they were contributing to society because they were providing uh material that was really read by people and really used and educated yeah. other people and that that is just a, a well a feeling of accomplishment i suppose yeah i saw i saw a great contrast between the, the pbl class the problem based learning class that i was telling you about earlier where eight students would solve a biomedical engineering problem. When I say solve, I don't really mean they solved it. You know, they, they, <laughs> they tried to tackle something like, like what causes the variability in a heart rate monitor or, or, um, how can we diagnose, uh, a cancer? In fact, one of the problems that, that the students were let loose on, which was mostly a modeling problem, was how do pandemics spread? Oh. So all, all of the students who took that class and, and learned that problem are probably now saving the world, I bet, yeah. because they really got into modeling of pandemics. And uh, so anyway, these problems at the time they took them weren't real world problems because the product of the class was a presentation. Maybe there'd be a few experts that were invited to watch the presentation, but there really wasn't any way that it got that their efforts got back to the real world and benefited it. It was kind of like the term paper where it gets put on the shelf at the end. And mm -hmm. I seeing that contrast between that and the ones in my neuroscience class where they were writing Wikipedia articles and doing other things that actually benefit the real world, it really reinforced how much more motivation the students got when they saw that what they were doing was benefiting the real world, not just uh, a toy problem, what I call a toy problem, but an actual real problem where they're where they're doing something that other people who aren't in the school can look at and say, yeah, I'm glad you did that. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there, you know, it, the same goes for uh, Amazon reviews, which was another real world uh, project based learning uh, assignment that you implemented. And um, I mean, you know, you, you talk about how you, the students would uh, keep uh, notebooks on how to perform certain acts and that these notebooks would stay in class so that, newer students coming in could see what the previous students did uh, in these binders uh, and and appreciate that they were learning from it. And it was, you know, uh, building this foundation of knowledge and getting passed along. Yeah. And in fact, even, even more in the real world, a lot of the um, research that my students did in their lab class, neuroengineering lab class, benefited my own research lab, you know, and became a binder in our research lab that we refer to all the time. So it was not just benefiting future students, but even benefiting real research that we would then publish, you know, so crazy. And they were building equipment. They built gadgets that at the end of the semester, the class is over. They don't need this gadget anymore. Guess where that ended up going? <laughs> so it ended up in our lab being used for something. You know, if, if you use the same trial and error sort of approach in your lab and 
managing a lab and and I know that that's one of the things that you miss is actually doing the lab work, building the micro microscopes, and you came to be more of a manager role. And that's one of the reasons why academia lost its uh, sheen. But presumably you uh, implemented a trial and error sort of learning process on how to run a lab and uh, get your students um, productive and, and engaged. I'm wondering when that book's coming out or if you're working yeah. on that one yet. Uh, that's an interesting idea. Um I won't say that I was a great manager. I, I was reasonably good, especially comparing to some other people who, who I know um, either just completely ignored their labs. You know, they, they were off at conferences all the time and, and basically assigned postdocs to be in charge of everything. Or the other side, which is kind of like my advisor when I was a grad student, which is run every little detail of the lab. Um, I was somewhere in the middle there, possibly closer to the uh, laissez-faire, let them run themselves side than the, than the micromanaging side. It was definitely a lot of trial and error. And the most important lesson that I learned eventually was that different students in my lab or, or postdocs require different management approaches. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And some of them required very little managing. In fact, some of them became experts at managing me. You know, they... Uh, I could think of one particular grad student who was fantastic at managing me. You know, he knew all of my quirks and foibles and would, would make sure, you know, like, for example, that if I hadn't responded to and say he was writing a paper and I, he knew I was editing it and I hadn't responded to it and got, gotten it back to him quickly enough, he would send me a little email saying, hey, Steve, have you had a chance to look at that draft that I sent you? You know, and I go, oh, shit. Yeah, I forgot about that. Steve. Yeah. Um, so, so. <laughs> So um, he was immensely successful. Hmm. I, I probably shouldn't mention which which person it was because because uh, you know all of my students I loved them all, but not all of them were equally successful. And some of them uh, needed a very uh, careful managing style with a lot of hand holding, and others were very you know I could just let them do what they wanted, and they came up with pretty good decisions on their own. So, so that's, you know, that was a lot of the trial and error was just getting to know individuals and realizing at some point that there is no such thing as a one size fits all way to manage a lab or probably anything, you know, whether it's a company or your classroom or anything like that. You, you really have to treat individuals as individuals and yeah. tailor. And that, that, that does take a lot of extra work. You know, when we're talking about extra work that you put into teaching a class, um, you were, I think you were asking me in, by email, you know, how many of the students were just unteachable or just you yeah. couldn't, I, I was unable to motivate yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I would say the answer is none, but the really hard ones were a lot of extra work. You know, if, if there was a student, and I can think of a few, there was always a couple, two or three students in a class of 100 that would just trouble. You can name them. What was that? You can name them. You remember their names, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I can name them. Uh, I'm thinking of one in particular. It was just a, a smart ass who was just always making negative comments about everything. So not only was he was he uh, negative about what we were doing, but he's kind of bringing the other students down. So oh. I kind of resented him. And and I was thinking about well, what happened in the end. He ended up taking uh, my neuroengineering lab class and somehow he liked the first class, the introductory neuroscience class enough, even though he was so negative about it huh. and constantly complaining about every little thing. And he took the neuroengineering lab class and did a fantastic project. Hmm. And his Wikipedia article that he wrote was a great one. In fact, I think it was, it was, uh, about multi-electrode arrays, a subject near and dear to my heart. Um, so this guy, he certainly was not a, a dumb student. He's a very smart person, but he was just not motivated. So he was one of the alumni that I interviewed. I interviewed a lot of alumni by using a Google form. I sent it off to my alumni and said, what do you remember about my class? What does it benefit you today? Did it influence your career choices? What are you doing now? You know, where are you? Um, and I got a good amount of feedback. I wouldn't say everybody responded, but quite a few people responded. And he was one of them. He's in industry. He's he's at a startup doing interesting work. And when he he looked back on the class and I and I said, you know, what was memorable? And he said, he goes, well, your suspenders, you know, just as a smart ass <laughs> joke because he had to make a smart ass <laughs> joke there because I always tend to wear suspenders. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he goes, no, he said, um, honestly, that was 
the only time I can think of in college where I was actually enjoying myself. Wow. You know, so that kind of gave me some insight into his, what was going on. There was probably some serious shit going on in his life that he was going through and making him what I considered to be a problem student. And if at the time I had gotten to know him a little bit better, I probably could have shepherded him in the right direction more quickly. But that's a lot of extra work. That's the Herculean effort that you refer to. Getting to know your students that well, especially the troublesome ones. Most teachers have have a natural instinct to throw their hands up and say, oh, that is a problem student. I can't deal with that person. I'm just going to ignore them as much as I can and tell them to shut up. You know, and you have to really resist that. Uh, and you have to ask yourself, how much are you willing to put into helping them uh, become motivated? It is possible. I, I honestly believe it's possible to motivate any student. I don't think there's any student who couldn't be motivated if you give them the right kind of attention and the resources that they need. Hey, you say in the book, oh, I, I don't I don't have the quote in front of you. You, you believe I mean, you're a, you're a growth mindset believer and that we're all geniuses uh, in some subject in one way or another. And it's just a matter of, of finding how to capture that and um, nurture it, I suppose. Yeah. And, and the corollary to that is we're also all really bad at certain things, <laughs> yeah. you know, that, uh, yeah. that students have pluses and minuses just like professors or anybody. Um, and... The, the, the aspects that any given student are really bad at may or may not be things that are important. You know, in the case of if it were algebra for me, you know, I, I wasn't terrible at it, but I certainly wasn't great at it. A student could have, uh, one of my teachers could have pulled me aside and said, hey, Steve, I noticed you really blew chunks on that last algebra <laughs> exam. What's going on with your life there? You know, and I, boy, yeah. would they have had a lot of stories to tell when they got home. <laughs> You know, I would have said, oh, yeah, well, my family is a bit screwed up. Um, that might have had something to do with it. So, they didn't. My teachers didn't bother getting into my life at all. They didn't They didn't try to get to know me personally. They didn't hold my hand. Even my best teachers, the few ones that were really good, those four that I can count on one hand with a finger missing, um, they didn't really get to know me personally, you know, but they were friends. We did stuff together in classes, in class that was not required. You know, like I remember one of them joined our unicycle club. And so we were riding unicycles in the homecoming parade together and stuff <laughs> like that. So, Steve, uh, this is a great resource. I mean, I, I recommend it, obviously, to to the listeners. And the reason why I brought up that it, it should be useful also in, in you know, self-motivation is is because I truly believe that, that, I mean, the, these principles can be implemented to set up your own learning system and at whatever stage of uh, a learner you are. I, I do want to ask <laughs> or, or just highlight one of my favorite, and I'm glad I remembered to say this, one of my favorite parts <laughs> of the book is... Um, and it's fairly inconsequential, actually, is now I have this image burned in my head of you uh, riding a scooter around the Society for Neuroscience uh, poster <laughs> session floor to get around. And I, because the poster session, is, it's in such a big hallway, and you make the point in the book that that was one of the best things that you did at a conference was investing in this little scooter that would fold up, and you could just uh, hop on it and ride to the other side in just a couple minutes where it would normally take 10 to 15 minutes just to get across the, the, the huge floor. And I'm trying to remember if I saw anyone on scooters at SFN and I, it must've been you because I don't, uh, did you see anyone else on a scooter? At that time, it was only a, a special purpose, high price device at the sharper image, you know, the, the, you couldn't buy them anywhere it wasn't else. It like was a razor. Was, yeah, okay. It was okay. a razor. You oh, know? it was, okay. And it was the first time they sold razors, was it for an outrageous amount of money at the sharper <laughs> image. Okay. And they, sub, you know, subsequently, as I mentioned in the book, they subsequently were owned by every single kid under 10. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and you. And few, yeah, and me. And I still have it. It's right over there in my uh, room with all my other mementos. Um, I occasionally do even ride it. Uh, but but the key thing is that um, it, was, it was a fantastic tool and I didn't care too much about how I looked. I also have these roller blades, roller blades. that you can yeah. unclip the wheels from. So, so they become hiking boots when you unclip the wheels oh. and that makes them very handy for conferences because you, you get to the place where you have to climb into your seat 
down a long row of chairs, uh, you don't want this, the wheels to be on them anymore. So you zoom over to the session where the com- where the talk is going on. And when you get to the door, there's usually somebody who wants to check your badge. And at that point, they're probably saying, no skating in here. Right. And right. you go, oops, sorry. Yeah. You pop your wheels off. And it goes, no, okay, I'm on feet now. <laughs> well, if you, it, these days you would, uh, you'd be building your own, probably building your own DIY drones. And that's how you'd get from a uh, poster to poster and <laughs> yeah, drop fly into your myself seat. to the yeah, next talk. Fly yourself. Yeah. Good idea. Well, Steve, thank you again. And, um, you know, it's, it's been a pleasure just having you on. Uh, I, I feel lucky that you were the number one guest on the show. And I, me I too. frequently, uh, feel lucky, um, to have, have had you accept my invitation. And once again, for 101, accept it again. So I'll, I'll see you in another hundred perhaps. Yeah. Great. Thanks a lot, Paul. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Brain Inspired is a production of me and you. I don't do advertisements. You can support the show through Patreon for a trifling amount and get access to the full versions of all the episodes, plus bonus episodes that focus more on the cultural side but still have science. Go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you for your support. See you next time. The stair